This is a long segment of a one hour and 30 minute available historic DVD production. The old shops nearby were still used occasionally by SP until the merger with the Union Pacific. The vacant foreground area used to have yard tracks for storage of equipment. At one time, this shop was busy rebuilding locomotives, such as seen here. Thousands of steam and diesel locomotives have been through this place. As one example, they remanufactured over 500 locomotives at the Sacramento shops in the 1970s. Over 450 of these were first generation GP9 and SD7 and 9 series locomotives. This extended their life into the 90s and saved SP the cost of replacing them with new locomotives. Another model of rebuilt locomotive is the SD7, which SP used for hump and yard service even into 1997. The number 1504 here still retains its full set of headlights from the early days, whereas the second unit, 1508, has had the oscillating Mars light removed and a Santa Fe style rotating roof mounted light added. This conversion happened to most SP engines during the aborted Southern Pacific Santa Fe merger of the mid 1980s. Let's take a moment to hear the unmistakable sound of old non-turbocharged EMDs drag a heavy cut of cars. This passenger depot was the second one which opened in 1925 after the original arcade station was deemed unfit for future business. This scene shot in 1995 shows a typical SP local with an eclectic mix of locomotives heading for Roseville and cruising right by the station platform. Once a busy place to see SP passenger trains, today the station serves Amtrak and Caltrain. However, it has long been a favorite for local fans to see the SP freight action with the ever-present possibility of meets and passes. This was another good location to see lots of run through and foreign power on SP trains in the 90s as well. The diamond once allowed the main line to cross the dormant Eilton branch, and it was removed to lower maintenance costs. This SP work train is possibly the last to cross the diamond as workers are preparing to remove it. 
This train is now crossing the Sacramento River on the first water crossing of the original Central Pacific Overland Route. This bridge was replaced in 1911 with this motorized swing bridge to clear boats needing more clearance than 14 feet. The bridge has two levels, the upper is for auto traffic while the lower is double track for trains only. After securing the bridge, a Caltrain from San Jose approaches the Sacramento station. This important location was one of only a few SP towers left in California. It controls traffic at the Y from the north, east, and south. This is where a train from Sacramento can run to the north to Roseville or south to Los Angeles by the way of the famed Tehachapi Line. Trains running north to Roseville will either take the Donner Pass Overland Line or the Shasta Route to Oregon, often referred to as the I-5 Route. Inside the tower, we find the old-style interlocking controls used to set the track switches, and they also tie into the signaling system. Working here is a tower operator who adds human judgment to decide which trains will be routed through here first whenever conflicts arise. Judgment for efficient traffic management and, of course, safety is a difficult thing to automate but eventually this tower will disappear like all the rest that have vanished in American railroading.
Roseville was the first town connected to the tracks laid from Sacramento, and the first train in operation was between these two points in April 1864. Before this, Roseville was just a Y off the Donner Pass main line for trains heading to Portland to the north. Until it was torn out by Union Pacific in 1997, this was a major classification and hump yard facility with full shops, engine rebuilding and repair facilities, and lots of activity. In recent years, Roseville was always a place to spot the unusual and rare units. Many trains that came through here were powered by units from many other U.S. railroads. Nothing could be too surprising here. The past two decades and all the mergers associated with them created new agreements and trackage rights arrangements between the competing roads that really increased the opportunities to see units from everywhere if you watched often enough. SP also tended to lease units from many sources during their struggling and rebuilding years of the 90s, and the units showed up from leasing companies such as Helms, EMD, and other railroads such as Santa Fe. Several years after the ICC denied the SP and Santa Fe merger, the SP was acquired by the smaller Rio Grande line. These two lines already had experience with joint operations, and SP and the Rio Grande seemed to almost freely intermix their power, even before the 1988 merger of the Rio Grande and the SP. These two had been working as partners ever since the Union Pacific and Southern Pacific had ended their mutual arrangements of cooperation in 1980. These elderly SD7s are being retired one by one from a group of 43 units bought in the early 50s. This model found a niche in hump yard service where its low speed mannerisms and non-turbocharged diesel are a match for the task. Originally a demo locomotive, 1518 is SP's first SD model bought in March 1952 and it was still running in 1997 as the elder statesman of locomotives on the roster. These units will probably all be bought by eager short lines. Dozens of diesel models from EMD, Alco, FM, and Baldwin have disappeared, 
but these machines just keep going. The big Reno sign at the east end of the yard is a reminder that we have to leave Roseville and head east for the Sierras and the challenge of a 7,000 foot elevation. The building of the Donner Pass line was a remarkable achievement, especially in view of the 1860s period. Pick, shovel, and blasting powder was the tool inventory back then, but it would be a big project, with even today's modern machines, to carve a rail line along numerous ridges and through the many tunnels conquering 7,000 foot elevations. All this was accomplished with year-round construction in the country as heaviest snowfall for any railroad territory. Many years have seen over 60 feet of snow. The average was 35 feet over the last 100 years. Even in good weather, this mountain line presents its challenges with grades on the western slope of almost 2.5% and placing demands on locomotive tractive effort and braking systems. More than one locomotive was designed or improved on from experiences learned on this line. The Roseville to Colfax section has a modest 1.5% grade for eastbound uphill traffic and a steeper 2.42% grade for westbound downhill traffic on the number one track. Colfax to Immigrant Gap features 2.42% for both tracks, and this is where eastbound locomotives are working the hardest.
After reaching Immigrant Gap, the grade lessens to 1.9%, but in the old days, trains entered an elaborate series of nearly 30 continuous miles of tunnels and snow sheds that made it miserable for the crews to breathe or see in due to the smoke from their own plus previous trains. Later, when diesels took over and became increasingly powerful, they would tend to overheat and have difficulty with combustion as lead units would foul the air for trailing units. Because of the steep grades, in the steam era there were nine walking inspections required of downhill westbounds to look for mechanical problems. Frequent stops were also needed at specified locations to cool the brakes and wheels. Some of the refinements to the Westinghouse air brake system were tested here under close observation in about 1908. The steady climb continues to the top at 6,900 feet for the eastward track and 7,032 feet for the westward track. While most of the snow falls on the western slope, the troubles aren't over. On the eastern slope, it can actually get colder, and in the early days, men had to ride the tops of freight cars, sometimes nearly frozen in place, to operate the brakes, which could be jammed from the cold. Many of these problems have been greatly improved concerning safety, crew comfort, and operating efficiency, but it will always offer challenges to the workers and equipment designers. Be sure to like and subscribe, it helps bring more content to YouTube.